Thank you for listening to the Allender Center podcast. I'm Dr. Dan Allender. And I'm Rachel Clinton Chen. We're fiercely committed to providing hope and healing to a fragmented world. And restoration for the heart. Thank you for joining us. Let's get this conversation started. Rachel, I I am so excited about what we're going to do over the span of a number of weeks. We're going to talk about what it means to live a well-lived story. The bottom line is, look, uh, our own story is never enough to, in one sense, guide us into living well. Uh, We need others. We need models. We need pictures. We need examples of people who draw us, uh, who in many ways uh, almost unnerve us with the level of their life. And to begin to see that the very qualities that make them so unique are the very things that our story is meant to reveal. And look, a a well-lived story is not about being in exotic places with well-known people with exciting endings. A a well-lived story uh, engages the very reality of living in a fallen world in a way that offers and engages justice and mercy. I love that passage in Psalm 85, justice and mercy kissing. And so, what what for you draws you to a human being? What are the qualities, Rachel, when you think about, just in a broad sense, what are the things that draw you to someone and you say, I want to be like you? Well, I think integrity will always be a category for me that is is really helpful. Just when there's a sense of, I know that I'm in the midst of someone who has integrity. And I don't just mean like, moral integrity. I mean the sense of they have come to know that they are made in the image of God and that all parts of them get to be along for the ride and that they're in a process. And I think um, about courage and this capacity, not bravery just for the sake of bravery, but a kind of courage to lean in um, to the tension of the already not yet to follow Jesus into places um, that are scary, that are that requ- like are not without fear. I never ever think of courage as being without fear. Um, and, you know, obviously kindness, um, the capacity, not niceness, kindness, um, the capacity. I think about the kindness of God that leads to repentance, a movement toward another. That extends grace, but also invites invites a kind of engagement that I actually think brings profound healing. Those, yeah, those are some that come to mind for me. Courage, curiosity, kindness. I think I would add. I like people who stay with the process, not mm-hmm. stupidly, <laughs> not with a kind of just utter stubbornness. Mm-hmm. But maybe something akin to it with this notion of commitment. So, I, we've got at least a number of categories, but let, let, let me contrast it pretty quickly. I, I think a lot of people live dull lives, not, not because they're not in an exotic place. Dull meaning small. Uh, they do little with their life other than in many ways, sustain themselves and perhaps a few people around them. I think of that as insipid. You, We know life is dangerous. And for the people who are trying to live a safe life, period, I, I, I'm all for safety. I want a refuge. But if all you have in your life is a commitment to that small, safe, insipid life already, uh, I, I don't want to be like you. Uh, and I think that sense of often those who live a small life often live with a level of, I don't know how to put it more kindly than this, sort of dogmatic presumption bound into self-righteousness that they're right 
<laughs> and, and the people they don't agree with, they're wrong. And whether that's over white privilege or, or whether that's over a particular view on sanctification, they know what's right. Uh, and they are right. And everybody else is pretty much wrong. That insipid, self-righteous life, uh, I just want to go, uh does not lead me to want to model my life after you. And anything else for you that you look at and you go, no, 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 I don't want, I don't want to go in that direction. Yeah, I mean, I think these are such hard categories, right? Because even as I hear you say those things, I'm I'm like, what are the stories that have led to that kind of living? And what are the encounters with a, I would say, like actually a false Jesus that have kind of lulled people into um I you know I would say something that looks like safety but is actually quite dangerous um but I think about um I find cruelty and contempt um to be characteristics um a way of being that um I don't want to be I don't want to be near um I think it brings harm I think it um I actually think it is like a cancer that eats at you, um, not just when you experience it from other people, but when it is what fuels you and fills you. Um, And again, I'm such a mercy person that I'm still always curious, like, how did these come to be weapons um, that have, again, given you a false sense of safety, but actually kept you from community, kept you from um, receiving what you're most meant for, um, I think other categories of stories that um, I mostly just feel sad about are uh, where convenience and comfort, and I think you've kind of already named this, but just a sense of, of um, needing to be um, more anesthetized and maintaining of the status quo, not wanting to rock the boat, not wanting to be disrupted, even if pervasive injustice is like right in your face. Um, I guess what I'd want to own is I know there are places in my own lived story where these characteristics have been true. Um, or, um, you know, this is probably one that you and I might differ on in our own story, like where this shows up. Um, cause I don't think I choose danger for the sake of danger, but I have a really hard time with people. I mean, I actually get mad when people live with a need for danger that is not translating into courage um, for um, justice and mercy and bringing about and participating in the kingdom of God. So, when danger exists, almost like a badge of honor, like I pursue these really dangerous things because, you know, I need to overcome, but that danger and that capacity for danger isn't actually showing up in how they live their life in community and how they live their life in the church, then I probably, that is a place where I am at risk of getting super self-righteous and super judgy. I mean, I don't, I'm not the hashtag safety first person for nothing. <laughs> oh, I, I, let's stay there for a moment. Uh, and that, uh, <laughs> like, I, I would say of myself uh, that my being uh, is wired for danger, yeah, uh, and I need danger. I drive a motorcycle. I hang out with bears in the summer, uh, and and yet, I think it is imperative to hear that if that kind of danger doesn't move into relational danger, like I thought, I was marrying a, a, a moderately safe woman, uh, <laughs> not not so much. Uh, mm-hmm. But I think I knew that. I think I knew I was marrying uh, a very dangerous woman who would tell the truth. And I, I know that sounds contradictory, but I'm full of contradictions. So, mm-hmm. the, the fact is, any story that is this deep commitment to move away from danger already is a life not worth 
uh, emulating. Uh, and so the question, though, is do we become experts at a kind of danger and then live with incredible cowardice in a hundred other areas? Mm. Mm. And I think that's where courage in one area is meant to be a spilling over, uh, mm. an invitation into far more. So, if you've got, in one sense, a willingness to play in danger, and it's not relational, and it's not systemic, that is, engaging the larger issues where uh, you're going to have to tackle uh, perspectives, ways of being that actually are bringing harm. Look, the world is harmful. If you don't step into that, you're not living a story that's actually emulatable. Yeah, and I mean, I think I would just say all of these characteristics are characteristics I see in the life of Jesus. And ultimately, like, as cheesy as it would sound, like, his story and the story we get to be a part of with Jesus, to me, is the ultimate um, example of a well-lived story. And so... Um, I look forward to kind of unpacking what we mean by these characteristics. And, um, you know, one of the things we're going to be doing in the coming weeks is actually inviting some of the people, some of whom you've already met, to to share with us um, some of how these characteristics have come to be in their life and story. Um, and that, I think, is going to just be really fun. Yeah, we're not going to tell you. I, I I almost slipped right there. It was, uh, <laughs> no, we're not going to tell you yet. But these are people we look at and go, I would like to be more like mm-hmm. person X, Y, or Z. Mm-hmm. And I think with courage particularly, it's that willingness to risk limb, life, wealth, reputation, to invest in, in goodness. I, I mean, to stand against injustice and to grow beauty. That requires an ongoing interplay of courage and a growing humility. And once we open the door to the word humility, I think we're into a second category, and that is, I don't know many courageous people who aren't also willing to learn. Uh, You know, the people who I know who love danger but don't want to learn, I don't uh, keep away from them as Far as I can, because they're going to kill me. They may not kill themselves, but they'll kill me. Uh, I need to know that you have a heart to learn, to grow, that you already know that in many ways you may know a lot, but the more you know, it ought to open the door to how much you know you don't know, Mm -hmm. which means that you are curious to discover far more about the nature of the world, yourself, and others. Mm -hmm. I mean, curiosity is a word I use a lot when I'm working with people, <laughs> when I'm preaching or teaching, and almost almost probably ad nauseum to the point where people might be like, okay, we get it. Like, yeah, be curious. Um, this is one of the things I love about my husband. He is a man of many questions, and time and time and time again, his curiosity um, has actually invited both of us to um, to a deeper level of trust and love and repentance. Um, I think of curiosity as the openness to ask, to seek, and to knock, Mm -hmm. but the deep sense that there is more of God to be found in every nook and cranny of this universe. Also, a keen awareness that what I know is only partially good and true, and I need a hermeneutic of suspicion that is kissed with kindness. Okay, okay, wait, 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 wait. What do you mean by, what do you mean by that? Um, <laughs> that's fair. You know, I think, first of all, part of being made in the image of God is that, uh, is, is being inherently relational. And I think one of the greatest, actually, I would say deeply destructive and maybe even heretical realities of some of our um, inherited theological framework is this sense that the image of God is, it can happen in individuality. Uh, I I actually think that is heretical because part of being image bearers is this intrinsic relationality. So, curiosity helps us remember 
that even though I am good and made in the image of God, I am still bound by my particularity. I am bound by um, my own bodily and embodied experience of the world, not just how I experience it, but how the world experiences me and how that informs how I see in my imagination. So, uh, it's a deep commitment to know that even as much as I know, even as much as I see, even as much as I seek and ask and knock, if I'm not doing that in community, if I'm not open um, to, you know, here's something I'll say very, very clearly. If I'm not open to feedback from my Black, Indigenous, Asian, Latinx, and and um, other friends and loved ones of color to hear feedback about what I don't know, then I think I'm in, intrinsically bound. Again, curiosity, without curiosity, without the capacity to receive what I don't know, then I will become self-righteous. I will become indifferent to the suffering others because it's not my suffering. So, when we use language like a hermeneutic of suspicion, you know, hermeneutic, uh, we've used this language before, but a hermeneutic is just a way of interpretation, a way of making meaning. So, this sense of, I need to be in my curiosity, also suspicious and curious about what I may not see, and how, no matter how much my intentions are good, that my impact could actually be harming. So, that sense of being kissed with kindness, a hermeneutic of suspicion that is Kiss with kindness, which I'm actually just going to own. Our words I've heard from you, Dan, um, is a way you've played with language. Um, this sense of, I don't have to be cruel to myself or to others in that suspicion. I can be kind, but there is a goodness and a boldness in being in community and knowing that we're never going to arrive. So, curiosity is a characteristic of a well-lived story that I think positions us to be lifelong learners, and not just learners for the sake of learning and, and a, accruing information, but wisdom, cultivating wisdom. Um, and, and wisdom, inevitably, if it's actually wisdom, will shape us to love better. No, oh, I love it. I mean, look, we are not the center of the universe. Let's just <laughs> let's just state the obvious. But we are contextualized. I'm a 68 year old male white person, and it is both binding and limiting. But it's also where we begin to ask the question: How? am I to live with others? How are others to live with me? And so, that notion of curiosity is own your context. Don't, don't condemn it. Own it, but also know that you have to have eyes from outside of your own centeredness to decenter you so that you can join a larger core and that core is the ultimate worshiping all languages, all races, all ages, all gender, in a way that allows us to actually become more of who we are. So, yeah, let's just say as we move, I mean, do you know many people who are courageous and curious who are not kind? I mean, I don't. I, I'll just say I, – I, it's not like you can have a kind person who's not courageous or curious. But I think that's a different category you brought up earlier in terms of saying there is a kind of compassion. Uh, it isn't niceness. It isn't just I feel for others. It, kindness, when I think about kindness, I think of the word ferocious. There's a mm -hmm. kind of ferocity mm -hmm. that comes with the ability to bless, honor, delight, and bring goodness to the presence of another. And that ability to enter heartache mm -hmm. and to know, oh my goodness, the, the suffering of the other, but as well to see the honor and glory in the other. Uh, the, the refusal 
to be bound by contempt, but to bring blessing. That's how I consider uh, kindness to show itself. And uh, I, again, I won't tell you who we're going to interview here, but uh, uh, let's just say uh, they're two of the kindest people I've ever met. Uh, and so, th- that that quality, literally, when it's bound with courage uh, and curiosity— Ah, there's nothing for me that just gives you more of a taste of the presence of God like kindness. Mm. Oh, and it's just like, I'm just so looking forward to getting to expand that category with other people because I do think when we hear a word like kindness, we we hear niceness. We hear be polite, don't make me feel bad. Don't name truth that's exposing. Some of the kindest people I know, like, really piss me off (laughs) in moments when they're offering kindness because they are inviting me, like, further up and further in. And they're exposing enough to say, I think you're meant for more. Mm -hmm. And I want to, I want to offer it to you. And sometimes kindness is really tender. And sometimes it is really ferocious. And I just, yeah, I, I, and to me, this is how I experience the kindness of God. I don't experience a placating, patronizing, pitying God. I experience a God who oftentimes feels like all up in my business in a way that is like, oh, uh, it's so exposing. And yet I know that that movement to imagine more for me than I can imagine for myself, to want to provide comfort in a way that sometimes I'm like, I don't want to be comforted to disrupt in ways that kind of um, invite me to love more deeply. So I think it'll be really fun to, to play more with that. Mm-hmm. Well, we're back to that Romans 2, 4 passage of, it is the kindness of God that leads to repentance, not not His holiness, not His wrath. It, 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 it's, it's the fact that kindness unnerves us. I, I mean, people who enter into danger, uh, courageous, I, I'm drawn to. People who are curious, I'm drawn to. But I'll tell you, uh, there's something about kindness that uh, terrifies me, and I think you put words to that. But that that's one of those notions that when a person really gets a hold of what kindness brings, uh, it is powerful. But we have one more category, one more, and it sort of links all three together in that, you know, I, I know a lot of courageous, curious, kind people But I think one of the hardest to stay with is this notion of commitment, being able and willing to acknowledge you're exhausted, uh, you are burned out, you are overwhelmed, and yes, there are times and seasons you need rest, you need Sabbath, you, you need to take three months off, but that kind of you stay with it. That word, commitment, uh, it's a very crucial word to describe a well-lived story. Mm-hmm. I think it's it's in some ways another way to talk about faithfulness. Um, it's the capacity to persevere um, and to do so not just, not just um, I think, in the realm of trauma. Um, one trauma response is to just power through, right? To to, to do more work. And so, we're not necessarily talking about, um, we're not talking about powering through. We're talking about a capacity to persevere with care um, for one's own body and other people's bodies, um, to the larger body, to stay on the journey for the long haul um, sustainably, right? Because I think part of faithfulness is sustainability, part of commitment is sustainability, not just to produce something, not just to get something done, but to actually lean in. Uh, and I think this is where hope comes into play, right? To to be about building sometimes in really small ways. And that's why I think it's important to just keep nuancing. A well-lived story doesn't have to be grand in the way that sometimes we perceive a story being grand. Some of the most 
well-lived stories I know will be people who never make it onto a, a, a stage. Um, their story might not be told to millions of people, but you see the fruit of their courage, their curiosity, their kindness, and their commitment to see um, justice um, roll down, <laughs> um, to see um, grace change people, this capacity to remain loyal through a heart to receive and offer forgiveness, um, not cheap forgiveness, not, um, yeah, I, I, the committed people I know, I follow them because they have cultivated a kind of resilience um, that brings life. And I want to learn from them. I want to uh, I want to know not only what have they gained, but what have they suffered to come to um, a faithfulness to something that they truly know and have tasted. Um, there's something about losing your life to find it, um, not unto annihilation, um, but I think our true like baptismal identity as children of God. Well, this is huge because I, I think of my own life, others, where I've seen false loyalty, where you remained loyal longer than what was wise because you were actually afraid to lose a relationship. And so, commitment isn't just remaining on a task, in a relationship, interminably when there are deep and good reasons for there to be change. What I see to be the core of commitment is that I, I, I have the courage to return, the openness to actually be curious and therefore hear more, indeed to let kindness rule. And when those factors are at play and a person remains committed, I think we've got four factors uh, that's life-changing. I mean, these are categories that we can look at and say, look, I think too often I live an insipid, dogmatic, contemptuous, and convenient life, and I don't want it. Uh, and I can look at periods, I can look at times where uh, I've lived a life that uh, does not bear what I want to be. But when I look to those others that I see, I think they probably would say some of the same sentences. Nobody lives a life without their own dark, difficult periods. But you keep coming back, keep on the path. And in that, uh, we've got someone to model. So, Rachel, where we are we're going to be talking to some amazing people in the next number of weeks. And I'll also add that as I think about people who fit these categories, my dear co-host, <laughs> uh, you are one of those persons who fit all four categories. Well, I could say sincerely, likewise. And we'll meet some people next week. Indeed. I wanted to take a moment as we, as we depart to tell you about a few opportunities that I really want to make sure you know about. So if you've been looking for more ways to get involved or are interested in diving into some of your own story work, we wanted to let you know about some exciting new opportunities happening here at the Allender Center. I don't know if you've already heard, but we just launched a brand new online course called To Be Told with the one and only Dan Allender. It's the same content as our conference, but now available for you to watch at home at your own pace. If you've ever found yourself asking, where is God leading me? Or why do I keep repeating the same patterns and ending up in the same types of relationships? I cannot recommend this course enough. You will be invited to love boldly, make sense of your story, find healing and make changes that last. Speaking of changes, we've had quite a few over the past few months as many of you know, and one has been that many of our trainings and workshops for the year ahead are now being offered virtually. So if you've not been able to attend because of travel requirements, this is a truly unique opportunity to take advantage of. The first I want to tell you about is Story Workshop, one that you've definitely heard Dan and I talk about here on the podcast. This workshop invites you to look into the themes of your life in order to understand, write, and tell your unique story in transformative ways. You'll hear teaching from Dan and myself, 
and actually a lot of other teachers as well. Um, you'll get to participate in small group sessions and receive many helpful resources along the way. So I really want to encourage you to check out the story workshop. It's going to be happening in August. Um, the other is our certificate and narrative focused trauma care level one, um, which takes place over the course of four weekends throughout the year and offers training to therapists, pastors, ministry leaders, stay at home moms, engineers, and many other advocates committed to working on behalf of healing and redemption. You get to learn from members of our teaching staff and you participate in a healing process yourself with a group of people under a seasoned facilitator. Both the story workshop and the certificate require applications. So check that out. You can find that on our website at theallendercenter.org, along with information about our new online course. The Allender Center podcast is produced by the Seattle School of Theology and Psychology. If you'd like more information about the Allender Center, you can look at theallendercenter.org.